So first finding we want to go through, and this is one of the ones that could potentially be life-saving and definitely management altering, will definitely change your differential diagnosis if you're thinking of other things, is intra-abdominal fluid. So there are multiple potential spaces in the abdomen. We're going to explore those a little bit, and as we do that, we will also dive into a little bit more detail about what some of the organs and landmarks are to help you identify these potential spaces. So there's really five potential spaces. We've got subdiaphragmatic spaces. We've got Morrison's pouch on the right. We've got kind of the pair splenic potential space, which is also subdiaphragmatic on the left. We've got pericolic gutter areas on either side, and then we've got the pelvis, which looks a little different from male to female, but those are our main potential spaces to identify peritoneal fluid. So first up on the right side, up around the liver, so just recognizing what liver looks like. So if we take a view, and this is how we would first initially examine the patient if we're looking for intra-abdominal fluid, it is starting up in the right upper quadrant in about the mid-axillary line, indicators at about 11 o'clock, and we can just kind of fan from ceiling to floor, look for the coronal views of the liver, we see diaphragm here. We don't really see anything going on in the lung if it's normal. And then as we move down, fan up or down, we may identify Morrison's pouch here. So these are potential spaces under the diaphragm or in Morrison's pouch on the right. On the left side, it looks fairly similar in the spleen. So this is spleen here. This is actually the right side to just give you comparisons. So potential spaces are here and here, Morrison's and subdiaphragmatic. On the left side, the subdiaphragmatic area is kind of more important because you're more likely to see fluid accumulate here. There is a spleno-renal ligament over here that generally prevents fluid from getting out down between these two organs. So our potential spaces are subdiaphragmatic and then up around in here. But there's kidney, there's spleen. These are some of the first areas to look for fluid accumulation in the peritoneal space or in the abdomen. So just highlighting, outlining our potential spaces where fluid may collect. This is where you're going to direct your eyes and your attention. And just a couple more examples to see somewhat the differences. And if you're ever evaluating the spleen, it's Itself, you'll note it's a nice crescent shape, it's homogeneous, nice smooth borders, and it's roughly about the same size as the left kidney. If you don't like measurements, like I don't, I don't like measurements, then eyeballing is the spleen pretty much the same size as the left kidney. It's a good quick eyeball way to determine whether you have splenomegaly or not. Otherwise, it's nice and homogeneous, smooth borders and things like that. It is important to note, especially on the left side, some things that may confound your view or confuse you. Depending on the patient's fasting or non-fasting status, you may see see fluid within the stomach. And a characteristic thing here is location. So you see it's kind of under this deeper part of the spleen underneath and it takes on a shape. It's got a rounded shape and you can even see kind of the outline of the rugae within the stomach. Same thing here. This is the stomach. Don't mistake this for free intraperitoneal fluid. Remember the potential spaces on this side are subdiaphragmatic and then up here kind of around the kidney. This area is not really a fluid of peritoneal fluid accumulation. The location, the shape can help you not misjudge the fluid that you might see here in the stomach. There they are outlined for you. Those areas represent the stomach. Location and shape will help you not mistake those for free intraperitoneal fluid. Then if we just move down the abdomen on either side, so just inferior to the kidneys on each side, usually we'll kind of fan the probe towards the ceiling in a little bit. We should be able to identify the pericolic gutters. Now when they're normal, they just look like a bunch of nothing because we have the air Air, the bright white air that kind of shadows everything out, these dirty shadows, they're not dark black shadows. Here we can almost see the outline of the hostra and the large bowel filled with air and then these streaky shadows here. This is just representative of the large intestine. You may see other variations where there's fluid in the intestine or stool, but a lot of times you're just going to see air. These are other potential spaces you'll see in the abdomen and if looking for free fluid you definitely need to include these areas. These may be the first areas to fill with fluid in someone who's bleeding in their abdomen or even accumulating a that's just the bowel outline, and when we see that, we know we're examining the pericolic gutter. Again, as noted, just a little text there to help outline those. So the last place we're going to look for free fluid is in the pelvis, and it looks a little different from male to female, so we'll break those down a little bit. So the male pelvis, again, the bladder is going to be small or large, depending on how full it is, but it should be somewhat fluid-filled. Notice, again, it's not a perfectly round shape. We see the prostate back here, and as we move through, that can help us identify here. These are both transverse views, so we have the probe right above the pubic symphysis, and indicators directed to the patient's right. We fan to their feet, fan to their head to examine the bladder completely. 
So just to highlight a few findings, this is the prostate. If your probe is fanned down low enough to see the prostate, you're now looking the posterior portion of the bladder, you're looking retroperitoneal. Sometimes as you fan through, you may identify these paired tubular structures that are the seminal vesicles. The main thing with seminal vesicles is just not to mistake these for free peritoneal fluid. They can be kind of a false positive. So I'm not sure that there are many reasons in the hospital or the emergency department to care much about the seminal vesicles other than to not mistake them for free perineal fluid. So just take a look at those and see how you can see them split down and away from the bladder as you fan through. If you want to look one more time, there they are, seminal vesicles and prostate in the male pelvis. Now in the female pelvis, the bladder looks about the same, but we have a few other landmarks. So if we take a sagittal view, we're going to see something that looks like this, where we've got bladder anteriorly here. The bladder is fairly decompressed, and we have an antiflex antiverted uterus, which is a cartoon image of what that looks like, just to outline some of these things. So here's what bladder looks like in a sagittal view. Then we can find the uterus and the endometrial stripe. We really just want to recognize these structures in the search for intra-abdominal free fluid. Just some other examples of sagittal views of the uterus, and then we do trans transverse views. This is often what we're going to do when we're looking for free fluid. This is what it's going to look like. So we see the bladder back here and as we fan, usually as we're fanning more towards the patient's head, we will see the uterus. Usually it's going to look like it's posterior to the bladder, although that's going to depend on how full their bladder is and the orientation of the uterus itself, which can be a little bit variable. But it's this muscular looking structure usually behind the bladder. So we'll just outline that there. Now I do want to point out how this can look a little disorienting at first if you're not familiar, haven't gotten a lot of practice with this. So what I want to point out is when the bladder is empty, it will look almost like the uterus sits on top of the bladder, which it does when the bladder is decompressed. So imagine our ultrasound beam is kind of slicing in this direction because we're up above their abdomen but we're fanning at an angle so that the beam is pointing down towards their feet. So this would be the path of our ultrasound beam. So when we do a transverse view of that, what we're going to see is this decompression compressed bladder with uterus that looks to be sitting on top and then sometimes we may see the cervix below. So essentially what you're seeing is the folded parts of the uterus folded over top of and around the decompressed bladder. So don't let that confuse you if you're used to looking for the uterus behind the bladder. If the bladder is decompressed and it's an antiflexed antiverted uterus, it may come to sit on top when the bladder is empty. So that's what we're looking at here. This is actually vaginal stripe here, but different angles we may see slice through parts of the cervix as well and see that folded around the bladder. But just to recognize what these structures are and why they may appear the way they appear when you do an ultrasound. We've seen the normal structures in the absence mostly of free fluid, so now let's just look quickly at what free fluid may look like. So we talked about the spaces. If we see fluid in those spaces, most of the time it's going to appear black if it's simple. So here's the right side. We see some subdiaphragmatic fluid. We see fluid in Morrison's pouch. On the left side, we see subdiaphragmatic fluid, but we don't really see fluid between the spleen and the kidney. So this is your kind of money area to look for on the left side to look for free fluid. Make sure you include the paracolic gutters when you're examining for free fluid in the abdomen. Come down below the kidneys, fan to the ceiling, and look for fluid. On your screen, it's gonna look like fluid kind of compressing the bowel down and out of the way. So that's what that's gonna look like kind of in the upper and mid abdomen. And then if we come down to the pelvis uh, in the male, we're gonna see fluid back behind the bladder. Again, depending on how much fluid there is, it may wrap all the way up around over top of the bladder, or if it's more subtle or a small amount of fluid, it's just going to be behind. This is what that's going to look like. Notice it doesn't have that kind of regular forking shape of the seminal vesicles. So free fluid there. And in the female pelvis, I always like to point out that you really need to identify the uterus to identify free fluid because the potential space in the female pelvis is the pouch of Douglas, which is posterior to the uterus. So just identifying the bladder may not be adequate in the female pelvis. You want to find the uterus and then fluid behind the uterus is true peritoneal fluid. So here's what that looks like here. This is the muscular uterus endometrial stripe and we see fluid within the abdomen. And same thing here. We just see part of the uterus here and this is a lot of free fluid in this pelvis. But if you just fan way down towards the bladder, you could potentially miss this. So in the females, if you're looking for peritoneal fluid, identify the uterus. Again, emphasize there. Now I think it's important to point out, depending on the scenario, free fluid, if the free fluid is blood, blood can sometimes pretty quickly start to clot. Clotted blood is no longer going to look black. It's going to take on different shades of gray, may even layer differently. So I wanted to point that out and show some examples. This is an example of a spleen that has spontaneously ruptured and you can see it's much larger than the kidney. 
It's got a heterogeneous appearance because there's actually blood and clot all in here. And in the pelvis of the same patient, we see this gray and somewhat mixed, here's some black free fluid. So this is actually clotted blood. So this is just a reminder that blood in the abdomen may not always appear as simple fluid. And this can be variable depending on just the stage of clotting that has happened. Recognize that we sometimes will see patients who have suffered whatever insult or injury or just started having pain in the past hour or so. Sometimes you can see clot early on. Not always, I just don't want you to miss it because you didn't see the black stuff sitting in their abdomen. The main kind of life-saving thing and thing that probably is one of the scenarios that has changed my differential the most in my life of using ultrasound is the unexpected intra-abdominal hemorrhage. Now there are some scenarios where we may obviously be thinking this maybe high on our list, like a patient who's presenting with signs or symptoms of possibly a ruptured ectopic. That's probably not going to be what we're looking for in the 85-year-old man. But also the spleen auto rupture, if we're talking about kind of outside of trauma, that's something that's actually being reported at possibly a higher incidence with some of the new anticoagulants that are on the market. So something to think about and something that might not be on your differential for some of these patients with spontaneous abdominal pain and shock. This is something to look for that may drastically change your differential and your management. And sometimes you have have elderly patients or patients who are obtunded or maybe they're intoxicated and they don't remember their trauma and they've got occult hidden injuries or trauma that you may only identify with early incorporation of ultrasound into their workup. And then these are less common, but probably all of us in our life are at some point going to see these patients that have this spontaneous intra-abdominal or abdominal vasculature abnormalities that can rupture. Celiac artery aneurysms, splenic artery aneurysms, mesenteric artery aneurysms and ruptures, erosions, things like that. Again, not common, but these are things that point of care ultrasound can help you pick up or clue you into very quickly that you otherwise might kind of run down the wrong path if you don't recognize these things. And then kind of mentioned the direct oral anticoagulants that may lead to other spontaneous intra-abdominal hemorrhage or has been linked to incidents of splenic auto rupture. So those are some of the scenarios where you're going to see these findings. So with all that said, that brings us back to our first case, which was a 60-year female. You want to hear the truth? This was my case, and I thought this lady clearly has a GI bleed, so we need to get some blood and get her scoped. No need to worry about any other possible things on the differential. Well, luckily, we decided to take a look and recognize this patient had spontaneous spleen rupture with intra-abdominal hemorrhage and needed operative management. Drastic change in management without looking with ultrasound could have led to the patient's demise Fortunately, the patient did well. In the next case was the 49-year-old male with abdominal distension. No prior history, but with the physical findings and what we see in the abdomen, we can say, hmm, probably has liver disease, certainly other things on the differential, but if you want to identify ascites, this is very easy with ultrasound, and maybe you're going to identify an optimal area to perform paracentesis. So that's why I want to introduce that as well. It's something you can easily quickly do at the bedside and using point of care ultrasound can increase your confidence and your efficiency. So those are pretty much the findings and there are certainly a few other scenarios but some of the primary scenarios where you can think about should I be looking for intra-abdominal fluid and I would argue anyone who's in shock we should search for things in the abdomen like intra-abdominal fluid or aortic aneurysm that might be ruptured and could be a source of shock. So those are some of the scenarios but also patients with just abdominal pain where we want to quickly get some answers, quickly shorten our differential and work more efficiently through that case. We come from the coronal view of the abdomen. Indicator is towards her head. We find the liver from this view. Big breath again. And we see liver below the diaphragm. It's fairly nondescript. If we fan posteriorly, here we can see the kidney and the spine. we get high enough, we can see the aorta and the IVC from a coronal section. We'll point out potential spaces again, subdiaphragmatic space. 
we see the spine. Spine should stop at the diaphragm. Kidney, Morrison's pouch. If we get below the kidney, Now I'm going to come over to the spleen, the left side. So here we come pretty much across from the xiphoid. We come pretty much across from the xiphoid. Indicators at about one or two o'clock. Almost back, hand on the bed. And we can see the spleen underneath the diaphragm. And if we fan posteriorly there, we see the kidney. In some patients, when you fan anteriorly from the kidney, you may notice fluid within the stomach itself. This should not be mistaken for free peritoneal fluid as it's not in the normal potential space where we would look for free peritoneal fluid and it also has a more roundish shape. So you can avoid mistaking gastric contents for peritoneal fluid by noting the location and the characteristic shape of gastric contents versus peritoneal fluid. So spleen is all uniform texture, fairly small, about the same size as the kidney. And we can see the spine bumps behind the kidney. If we fan below the kidney, we see these bowel gas bubbles. That's the pericolic gutter. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the bladder. So bladder is always a little lower than you think it's going to be. So we fan, we get right above the pubic symphysis, fan towards the feet. Here's the bladder. It's not a circle. It's kind of a trigonal shape. And as we fan towards the patient's head in the female, we see the uterus. And in this case, we see a small amount of free fluid, which is normal behind it, but that's where we look for free fluid in like a trauma setting. And in this case, we can see left ovary. And I can see right ovary. And just a sagittal view. see bladder in front, uterus, posterior cul-de-sac with a small amount of normal physiologic free fluid. All right, just the difference of the bladder in the male versus the female. So again, we're looking for the bladder just above the pubic symphysis. Take note that the bladder is not a circle. And in the male, we can see there's prostate sitting back there as we fan up, then we shouldn't see really much else.